mine our days that God has numbered. I was made to walk with Him, yet I look for worldly treasure and forsake the King of Kings. But mine is hope in my Redeemer, though I fall, His love is sure. some praise.
I'm Quincy. I'm nine years old. And I think I'm ready to get baptized. I decided to follow Jesus' his, his teachings and mostly here just to well, tell people about God. I came to Jesus to Jesus because I was wondering how we were made how like I was born knowing that my like I was born from my mom but there would have to be someone that were, that was made somehow by something then I was brought over to church to church and um, learned about God and I didn't believe about anything else because I didn't know what to believe. So I just believed in God. I want to be baptized because I want to, I just want my sins to be just gone. My name is Quincy and I decided to follow Jesus. Let's worship him. Lord, if I find favor in your sight, Lord, please hear my heart's cry. I'm desperately waiting. I'll travel near or far for your glory. Yeah, I will do anything just to see you, to behold you as my king for your glory.
Berean family and friends, glad you could join us again. Uh, I know many right now are uh, staying home just to be safe. Let me say this, if you're new to the area, if you're new to this Berean stream, uh, just know that uh, our church is gathering outdoors right now. Uh, 9.15 every Sunday morning, we're going to gather outside and uh, Lord willing, if the weather's fine, and uh, we're right now moving to an indoor service uh, starting on September 27th, so very excited about that. You'll hear more details. There'll be a registration process and making sure we can socially distance and those sorts of things, but we're really excited to finally begin slowly getting back to kind of normal routine. So uh, if you will, take your copy of the scriptures. We're going to be back in Matthew 5 as we wrap up this last chapter, uh, in, or, or rather this last, the last few verses in Matthew chapter 5. And as you turn there, let me say this, all of us know uh, in some regard we all have different abilities, different natural uh, abilities. So some things come easy to us, uh, some things come very hard. So for example, my kids know in the, in the Merritt household, listen, if you've got homework, and specifically, if you have math homework, whatever you do, do not take math homework to dad. They know I have no concept. They know I have no clue. In fact, kids, maybe some kids are watching or some students in middle school or high school know this, that starting in third grade, I had to be tutored in math. Every, every week it, during the summers, I would go in and Miss Shawa would try to uh, teach me about fractions and decibels and all these kinds of things, and it was a complete train wreck. She did her best. Uh, I never made better than a C in math, oftentimes making far uh, worse than that. It was not a pretty thing. I'm so grateful for phone calculators that now I can pull it up on my phone and do it. Better yet, uh, the Lord in His grace allowed me to marry a woman who in her head can figure out uh, the tip calculator when we eat out for dinner. She knows she can figure out the meal and uh, 18%, whatever that is, she can give it to it. Uh, give it to me without me having to worry about it at all, which is a good thing because I would probably screw that up as well. So, whether it be a talent in math, whether it be a talent in science, a talent in reading, some of us are gifted naturally in sports and athletics, some of us are gifted na naturally in music, the thing that I hope we're picking up from Matthew chapter 5 is this, that being a part of the kingdom is not natural, that being transformed with the gospel is far from natural. Something supernatural is taking place. So what Jesus describes here in Matthew chapter 5 is radically different than what naturally comes to us. So for example, I was uh, reminded even this week in Galatians chapter 5, Paul is speaking and he's talking about the fruit of the Spirit. Do you remember this passage? Here's what Paul says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, Patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And then he says this, something odd. He says, against such things, there is no law. In other words, there's a sense that people when they're Christians, or, or people when they look at Christianity, they think that it's just about following laws, it's about being moral, uh, you know, it's just about people trying harder, doing more. And Paul is going to tell us, listen, there's no law, there's no morality that's going to create what what the fruit of the Spirit provides. Only the Spirit can provide these things. Only the new birth is going to provide what Jesus uh, says here. We need a new heart. Uh, we need a new desire. And that's why Jesus says in verse 20 that unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you cannot inherit the kingdom of God. So moral people and religious people will look at the law like they did in Jesus' day and say, well, listen, the Bible says don't commit murder. So as long as you don't physically murder somebody, you've kept this commandment. And Jesus says, now, wait a minute. What about the anger in your heart? Well, what about every time you call someone a fool? You, the seeds of murder in their seminal form are, are deep down into your heart. And the same thing with adultery. They thought, well, listen, as long as I'm not sleeping with a man or a woman that's not my husband or wife, I'm, I'm fine. I haven't committed adultery. And Jesus says, now, wait a minute. What about the lust in your heart? If you look at a woman with lust... You've already committed adultery in your heart. You see how radical that is. Last week we saw about turning the other cheek and going the extra mile. And these things that are so foreign to us as it relates to dealing with difficult people. And now we come to even something more counterintuitive. And that's when Jesus says, not only do you have to love your neighbor, you have to love your enemy. 
Friends, we live in a world, we live in a context, in a nation. Uh, this is far from what we see, is it not? We hate our enemies. We retaliate against our enemies. We look at our uh, political foes, or we look at our foes in our uh, business world or in our jobs. Uh, we look at our neighbors and people around us, and we hate them. We retaliate. We, we don't want to say anything good about them. And Jesus gives us something so radically different here in Matthew 5. So this is what we're going to see this morning. If you can join me in verse 43, we'll read all the way to the end of the chapter in verse 48. Here's what Jesus says here, verse 43. You have heard it said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. For he makes his son to rise on the evil and on the good. He sends rain on the just and on the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? You, therefore, must be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Berean family, this is God's Word. Uh, this passage divides neatly into kind of two parts. In part one, uh, Jesus is going to give us two commands regarding our enemies. And in part two, he's going to give us the reasons why he gives us the command. So let's look firstly at part one. That what are the two different commands that Jesus gives regarding our enemies? Command number one is this. We're to love our enemies. We're to love our enemies. That's what he says there in verse 43. Notice he says, you have heard it said... You shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. Now, again, what we've noticed about this passage is Jesus' problem is not with the law. He's quoting from the law here, but his problem is not with the law, but the interpretation of the law. Now, some of you may be thinking to yourself, now, wait a minute, I know I've heard you should love your neighbor. I've never heard you should hate your enemy. Where in the Bible does it say that? And that's exactly the point. There is nowhere in the scriptures that say that. Rather, what was happening was the religious leaders were saying, oh, well, the Bible says love your neighbor. And they were beginning to define neighbor however they saw fit. People that believe like them. People that ethnically look like them. And rather, everybody else that was outside of that was their enemy. Oh, well, we, we're not commanded to love them, so that must mean that we should hate them. That's how they began to interpret this. And this is what happens when the human heart is left to itself. It takes anything that's good... And it twists it. It can manipulate it. And really what we see throughout church history is people can even weaponize God's Word and, and use God's Word uh, as something that it was never intended to do. So, for example, we know that throughout history, religious people have used the Bible to condone slavery and segregation. Uh, they've used it to condone murder. How many times have we heard of somebody that bombs an abortion clinic and does it under the name and the guise of some kind of Christianity? I've heard of people that condone an adulterous affair based on the Bible or some nonsense of, well, listen, Jesus wouldn't want me to be unhappy and my marriage was unhappy. Here was a person that makes me happy. And, and so anything that you want to use, you can twist it and you can use it however you see fit. And so what you see is oftentimes, and this might be helpful to kind of chase this rabbit, maybe you're thinking to yourself, maybe you're watching now and and you're kind of skeptical of Christianity, and you've heard uh, people like Richard Dawkins, or the late Christopher Hitchens, or Sam Harris, kind of renowned atheists, and they talk about Christianity. They talk about religion, and they say, you see, this is what Christianity does. This is what religion does. It, it breeds a kind of hatred. And then they go to passages in the Scripture and show how it breeds Scripture. And really, I think what we see... Our two main areas, let me, let me pause and just say this, especially if maybe you're not a Christian and, and you're struggling with things that you see in the Bible. I think there are two different places that people often accuse the Bible of promoting hatred and violence. One would be with the Canaanites in the book of Joshua where you've got this passage where Israel goes into this land to conquer under God's commands to conquer this people, to bring judgment on this people. And they say, well, look, this is what happens. It's the good guys versus the bad guys. Now, the problem with that is that situation was a lot more complex than you think. So, for example, this was not about, God made it very clear, this was not about good guys versus bad guys. Rather, the Canaanites were a abhorribly wicked people that were committing all kinds of moral atrocities. Not just biblical history tells us this, 
Uh, historians tell us this. They committed atrocities that made the Nazis and the Taliban look like amateurs. And so God made it very clear that he wasn't siding with the Jews as if they were more holy and righteous than anybody else. Rather, this was about judging wickedness and moral atrocities and murder and all kinds of injustice that was going on there. Don't forget as well, if you read the rest of the Old Testament, do you notice how God's not picking and choosing So you have this one situation with the Canaanites, which is very rare in the Bible. Well, then all throughout the Old Testament, what we see is the nations like the Philistines or the nations like the Babylonians or the Assyrians. And God uses foreign nations to come in and judge his own people when their own sins, when their own moral atrocities were corrupting uh, the world that they lived and the cultures that they lived in. In other words, the point that we see in those passages... Uh, is is the reality that God is holy and righteous, and when we commit moral crimes against Him, we deserve His punishment. We deserve His judgment. So the other part of that too is what's known as imprecatory psalms. Big word I know. Imprecatory psalms are very rare. You see a few of them in the in the psalms, but what that is, it's when the psalmist prays out to God and he asks God to bring His judgment on His enemies. And people read that and they say, "Well, look at this. This is." disturbing. Here's this man kind of calling down fire on his enemies. This is what religion does. Uh, This is what uh, Christianity does. And the problem with that is when you read the imprecatory Psalms, you realize very quickly that the psalmist, God's people, are under tremendous pressure. They're being hunted down. They're being murdered. They're being killed. And the psalmist is crying out to God to see the injustice, to see the atrocities that are going on. And he's calling God to act. He's calling God to step up to see what's taking place. And notice one of the other things, too, is the the psalmist never takes violence into his own hands. The Old Testament repeatedly says, Vengeance is mine, says the Lord. God's people have always been the kind of people that allow God to to judge. We don't judge. That's why Paul says in Romans 12 that we're to leave room for the wrath of God in our own hearts, in our own lives. This is not about personal vindictiveness. Which is why even in those imprecatory psalms, in their next breath, the psalmist says, to, right after he prays for God's judgment to come on the enemies, for God to see what's taking place, he says, search my heart, try me, know my thoughts. In other words, there's a sense of, God, I, my motives here are pure. I want your protection and your provision for what I see. So when you go to Leviticus, Leviticus tells us not only to love our neighbor, Leviticus actually says, love the stranger around you as yourself. Love the immigrant, the sojourner. He says, Proverbs 25, 21, if your enemy is hungry, give him bread to eat. If he's thirsty, give him water to drink. What about the book of Jonah? Jonah gets angry because God chooses to save and rescue the Assyrian people, the natural enemies of Israel who committed all kinds of moral atrocities against them. And Jonah gets angry because God chose to be merciful and save them. That's the whole point of the Good Samaritan as well. When Jesus tells this parable, well, who is my neighbor? That's what they were describing. Who do I have to be loving towards? And who is the neighbor in the Good Samaritan? It's a Samaritan man, someone who is religiously and racially different. And Jesus is saying, that's your neighbor. The one who's religiously different than you, you love him, you serve him, you you offer blessing to him. Someone that's racially different from you, you must love them, you must provide for them. If you see them in need, you must go to them and, and serve them and help their need. That's what we see throughout the scriptures here. And even the verb that Jesus uses when he says, love your enemies, it's, an, it's a present imperative, meaning we have to keep loving our enemies. It's not that we just love them one time and we've kind of done our duty and then we move on. No, we, we keep loving them. Friends, this, this is the point. Naturally, the human heart doesn't gravitate towards loving our enemies. We retaliate. We, uh, we serve evil for evil uh, in our homes, in our neighborhoods, in, in our politics. Uh, and, and Jesus is saying that a person that's been born again, that's a part of the kingdom, loves enemies. Number two, Jesus says, not only love your enemy, pray for your enemy. So notice again in verse uh, 44 there, he says, But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Again, there's the present imperative Uh, Meaning there should never be a time where we're not praying for our enemies. Think about what Jesus says here. I think what Jesus says here about prayer is more for you and me 
than it is for our enemies. Right? I mean, our enemies are blessed by our prayers when we pray for them. But I think Jesus is saying here, as much as anything else, it's about you and me. In other words, I think Jesus has already been talking to us about what it means to love our enemies. He's already told us last week we learned about turning the other cheek, giving more than it's required of you, laying down your rights to serve your, your enemy, to go the extra mile if your enemy has need that you provide for them. So we know kind of what we're to do but I think he says, pray for your enemy because prayer at that point begins to change us, does it not? It's hard to pray, Lord, bless my enemy. It's hard to pray, Lord, be gracious and merciful to my enemy if my heart is filled with anger and vitriol and animosity towards my enemy. Christian, this is not optional for you and I. When was the last time you prayed for your enemies? When was the last time you prayed for those that are religiously different than you, that might want to harm our country, our families? When is the last time you prayed for maybe somebody at your work who's spreading lies about you, who wants to harm you in some way? Are you praying for them? Are you praying that the Lord would, would be merciful to them? Are you praying that the Lord would uh, open their heart to the truth of the gospel, that He'd bring repentance and faith into their life, that they, you seek no harm or no ill will against them. And the fact is this, our enemies may seek to harm us, they may curse us. Our enemies may call down cursings on our head. You know what a Christian does? A Christian calls down blessing on our enemies. That's what a Christian does. And let me say this too, friend, don't, don't wait till you feel love in your heart. Sometimes we say, well, I don't feel love towards this person. I just can't do it. And I would say this, pray for your enemies, even if there's, it doesn't seem to be a single ounce of love in your heart. And notice how, when you begin to pray and ask the Lord to give you new desires that he gives us in the gospel, when he gives us a new heart that wants to live and honor and, and work and, and look like Jesus, slowly our hearts begin to change. Because this is what we see, is this not the gospel story, friend? That Jesus Christ didn't seek to bless those that loved him. Rather, Jesus Christ served to bless his enemies. Paul says in Romans 5, you see at the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. He says, very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, church, while we were enemies of God, Christ died for us. That's what Paul says in Romans 5. So if we prayer, what we do is we look like Jesus. We act like Jesus. We act like our Heavenly Father because we humbly come to our enemy. We stand by His side and we plead that the Lord would bless Him in our prayers. Do you have the ability to do that? Do you have the ability like Jesus Christ on the cross that prayed, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. That's what his enemies did. His enemies killed him, crucified him. I, I love this quote John Stott uh, said this. He said, Jesus seems to have prayed for his tormentors actually while the iron spikes were being driven through his hands and feet. Indeed, the imperfect tense suggests that he kept praying. He kept repeating his entreaty, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Listen to this. Stott writes, if the cruel torture of crucifixion could not silence our Lord's prayer for His enemies, what pain, pride, prejudice, or sloth could justify the silencing of ours? That's it, church family. Do we look like Jesus? Do we act like Jesus? Do we have the ability to follow Jesus even to loving others like ourselves? And this actually takes us now to the two reasons. So this the... The two commands that Jesus gives where Jesus says we ought to love our enemies and pray for our enemies. Now he's going to show us why we ought to do that. Why, why should we love our enemies and pray for our enemies? And it's very simple. Jesus says, number one, so that you look like a son. Church family, we do this so that we look like a son. Look at verse 45. Verse 45. Or actually, actually, we'll start in 44. He says, but I say to you, love your enemies... And pray for those who persecute you. Notice, so that, why do you do it? So that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. So that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. Now, let me, let me say this. Too, look quickly, 
two quick things here to, to notice. Uh, in our modern era, some of us may be a little bit offended that the Bible constantly talks about sons and not daughters. So some, sometimes we think, well, why doesn't Jesus just say so that you can be sons and daughters? Why does it, you know, the Bible is so patriarchal, right, in, in its language. And, and the, the reality is this. When you read the Scriptures, it is very rare when you see anything about sons and daughters. Uh, it's almost always so that you're, that you're sons of God. And, and here's the thing. If you understand what the Bible is saying, uh, it was radically... Uh, radically controversial in Jesus' day to say this, but for the opposite reason you probably think. So in Jesus' day and in Paul's day in the New Testament, uh, women were not educated. Uh, they were not heirs to the family inheritance. Uh, only men were trained. The men ran the, the businesses typically for the family. Uh, and so when Jesus comes on the scene, and when Paul comes on the scene and they say, Live like sons of God. In other words, what they're saying is this, that in God's economy, all of us are sons. All of us are treated like sons. Whether you're a man or a woman, you all have the full rights, the full responsibilities, the full blessing of what it means to be a part of the family of God. And so it had to be this way because, again, the, the women need to know they were being brought in as well. I love, that's why Paul says in, in the book of Galatians that in Christ's economy and in the gospel that there is no male or female. Now, Paul is not saying that there's no gender. We know throughout the scriptures, Genesis 1 clearly tells us that there is gender. God made them male and female. But rather what Paul is saying, listen, if you understand the God's economy and, and grace and his forgiveness, there is no hierarchy. There is no patriarchy that... Men and women are co-heirs. And so Jesus is saying to us, prove that we're sons with the full rights, the full privileges of everything that's here. Not only that, uh, notice as well, the, the second thing that I wanted to highlight. Don't take these verses to mean that, okay, what well, Jesus is saying that unless I love my enemy, I'm not a child of God. All right, so it's basically on me. I, I've got to do something for God to see that I'm really serious. And then when he sees that I'm loving my enemy, then he'll... Forgive me, welcome me, and I'll be saved. And that, again, totally abuses the gospel and turns everything on its head. It makes everything about us. Rather, what Jesus is saying is, uh, we are to love our enemies so that we show that who our Father really is, so that we show we're already a part of the family. You see, that's what children do. Children look like their father. So, you know, one of the things that I've noticed in my own family, well, you know, we may put up a picture, a family picture, and people will be commenting under the picture on Facebook or whatever it is, and they'll say, man, Tucker looks just like his, his old man. Tucker looks just like his father. Poor Tucker, right? You know, thank the Lord that the girls didn't get their looks uh, from their father but their mother. Because everybody looks at Tucker and he's cursed with his gargoyle father's uh, looks. But you know what I'm talking about. We all look at our sons and we say, well, they have the certain mannerisms. They have a kind of maybe a quirkiness uh, to them. Maybe they just look like their father. They act like their father. And that's what Jesus is saying here. He's saying you never look more like your father than when you love your enemy. Because that's exactly what the father does. That's exactly what he, he takes part in. That's what, Again, look at verse 45. So that you may be sons of your father in heaven. Notice who makes his son rise on the evil and the good and sends his rain on the just and the unjust. God gives sun and rain to both evil and good people, to both the just and the unjust. The sun in the scriptures is kind of a picture of a second chance. It's a picture of a new opportunity. So the fact that the sun rises again on somebody that hates God on somebody that's evil and wicked. Is that not a picture of God's grace? That God could judge them right now for their sin, but rather, He gives them another day. He gives them another opportunity. So, He, he allows the sun to rise on His enemies. Not only that, He brings rain to those that are just and unjust. Rain is a picture of God's provision. If our earth didn't get rain, we wouldn't have water, we wouldn't have crops, we wouldn't be able to have a sustainable kind of life. And, and what Jesus is doing is he's teaching us about the very heart of God. What is God like? God is like someone who looks at his enemies and rather than pour out wrath and judgment, he blesses him. He gives him 
more grace, more mercy, more provision, even though he doesn't have to do that. You know, it's scary when I think about my children talking about me. There's a sense in which, you know, people kind of look at the pastor of a church and, and they think, oh, well, there's a super spiritual guy. He's got all the answers to the Bible. And the reality is my kids do not see me that way. Uh, the reality is they're there in the mornings when I wake up a bit cranky. Uh, they're there in the, in the evenings when I go to sleep tired and cranky. They're there when I'm in my car driving in gridlock traffic when somebody cuts me off. They're there when I'm at the house trying to fix something and annoyed. And there's a sense in which my children, if, if they were to say, hey, what, get, describe your father to me. What's his natural disposition? Easily they could say that maybe I would be cranky, irritable, angry at times. And yet, the tension is this. Sometimes when we read the Scriptures, for whatever reason, church family, because this is how we are, because we're naturally cranky and irritable and angry, we begin to associate those same things with God instead of seeing God for who He really is. What is God's natural disposition? Did you know in Lamentations 3.33 that the prophet Jeremiah, when he's writing this book, Lamentations is a book about uh, how God's people are suffering because God brought judgment into their heart and into their lives and the nation is being punished for their sins. And, and God is restoring them, but Jeremiah the prophet says this, that when God punished his people, he says, he doesn't do it from the heart. That when God punishes us, he doesn't do it from the heart, meaning God has no pleasure. He's like a parent that he hates to discipline his child, but he knows he must do it for their good and for their well-being here. So he doesn't do it from their heart. Not only that, in Isaiah 28, Isaiah is writing about God, and Isaiah says that anytime you see the judgment of God, the punishment of God, he, he describes God's judgment as God's, quote, strange work. It's strange when God has to judge but when God blesses his enemy, when God gives grace and mercy, it's his natural work. You see that? Church family, I don't want to take away from God anything. His justice is right. His judgment is right. These things are a real part of the gospel story for, for good reason. But the point is this. Church family, we want to begin to look and see God for who he is. This is the good news of the gospel, friend, that God has been more than gracious for us. We sin, we sin again, and yet God's heart... His desire is to bless His enemies, to shower them with more grace, with more mercy. That is the story of the gospel, that Jesus Christ would stand in our place. He would suffer. He would take our punishment, our penalty, not when we sought God, not when we loved God, when we were enemies with God. This is who God is. So Jesus would say, Love your enemy and pray for your enemy, number one, so that you look like a son. But here's the second thing, and here's where we end. He says, not only so you look like a son, but secondly, so you look different. Friends, so you look different than the rest of the world around you. Look at how the, the chapter ends in verse 46 to 48. He says, for if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? You, therefore, must be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. I think what Jesus is doing here, he's saying the same thing, but from a different angle. He's kind of turning the diamond around, if you will. Uh, when we love and bless our enemies, Jesus would say, you, there's never a time where you don't look more like your Father in heaven when you love and bless your enemies. The counter, we would think Jesus would say, well, listen, if you hate your enemy... When you hate your enemy, there's never a time that you would look more like lost people and pagan people. But you notice he doesn't say that. Notice Jesus says, well, listen, everybody loves. It's easy to love people that love you. It's easy to bless people that bless you. Jesus says when you do that, don't tax collectors do that? Don't pagans do that? In other words, in Jesus' day, these were the people that everybody hated more than anybody. Tax collectors uh, were embezzlers. They completely stole from the people that they collected taxes from. They would give some to Rome, and then they would just pad their pockets. So they preyed off of everybody else, and they were hated for it. Pagans were idolaters. They worshipped all kinds of false gods. They rejected the God of the Bible. And Jesus was saying, now wait a minute. Show me any tax collector and I'll show you a person who loves. 
I'll show you a person who blesses. The only difference is they bless people that love them and they bless people that bless them. Same with pagans. Same, anybody can do this. So, in other words, if all you're doing, friend, is, is loving people that look like you, act like you, love the same things you love, love you, bless you, if, if all you're doing is loving those kinds of people, your behavior is more pagan than it is Christian. It takes supernatural power, church family, to love our enemies. It takes a new heart. It takes a new desire to love our enemies. None of us do this naturally. And I think the tendency for us is we look at ourselves and we want to judge ourselves on the standards of, oh, well, look at all the things that I'm doing for this person over here. Look at all the ways that I'm blessing this person over here. Let me ask you this. Is your blessing and grace and mercy that you shower on people, is that just to people that you enjoy blessing? Is that just to other Christians? Do you bless your Muslim neighbors? Do you bless immigrants that have come into this country and stand in need? Do you bless people that are critical and, and, and hate you and, and dislike you? Do you only bless people that bless you? Do you only love people that love you? Listen to this. Alfred Plummer once said this. To return evil for good is devilish. To return good for good is human. But, re but to return good for evil is divine. That's what Jesus is saying here. Only the gospel can create this. Only somebody that's been born again that realizes this is exactly what Jesus has done for me can have a transformed heart, a transformed desire that begins to love even their enemies. No wonder Jesus would say at the very end, you must be perfect as your, as your Father and heaven is perfect. You see what Jesus is saying here? Listen, if you read Matthew 5 as a kind of set of moral demands, you're going to read this and, and that reading is going to feel very unattainable and impossible. Rather, Jesus is not describing these kind of moral demands. Rather, he's giving a picture of what it looks like to live in God's kingdom. He gives us a picture of the good life, the kingdom life, of life in the family of God. And he says, look around at all my children. They look a certain way. They act a certain way. And now, friend, it's our job to look at our own heart and say, okay, God, is, is this what you've created in my life? Do I give evidence that I'm born again, that I look like my Father in heaven? Or do I give evidence that I love like the world, hate like the world? Church family, only the gospel can create the kind of change that Jesus gives us here. I trust and pray that he continues to do that here at Berean. Let me close in a word of prayer. Father God, what you say in your word, your law, the commands that you give here in this Sermon on the Mount, Father, we know that uh, we've failed time and time again. Father, we stand condemned. Father, we stand uh, rightfully deserving of your judgment and your punishment. Uh, Father, I pray that right now in an act of great grace and mercy, your spirit would convict hearts. Show us how far we've fallen from your standard, Father. Show us how we are sinners in need of a Savior. Father, remind us, remind us that Jesus Christ suffered and died for his enemies. And Lord, he purchased for us our righteousness. Father, He took our penalty, the punishment that we deserve on the cross. He suffered the death that we deserve. And three days later, Father, He rose again, proving that He had done everything that He needed to do to win our salvation to Him. Father, I pray that right now, if there's a person listening to this message that's never put their trust and faith in Jesus, that they would cry out in repentance and in faith to You, that they would receive that free gift. Father, I pray if there's anyone here this morning that is a Christian that recognizes, okay, I've got enemies and I've hated them. I've retaliated against them. Father, will you bring conviction, transform their heart, transform their life, that they would see who you are, that they would see who they are, and that you would make them like their Father in heaven. Father, all of this we pray it and we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, friend...
So grateful that you could join us. Don't forget a couple of things. Uh, very soon we're going to have an indoor service. Also, very excited that today, if you're watching this Sunday, September 13th, Sunday, September 13th, our newlywed, new married class uh, will be beginning 4.30 at the church. We'll social distance. Uh, just show up. Even if you didn't get a chance to register online, you can show up. We can get you a spot. Uh, we're excited about what the Lord is doing. More things to come in the days ahead. Bless you, and we'll see you next time.